Welcome everybody to CSM Mastermind. I'm Andrew Marks, co-founder of Success Hacker and our success coaching training program. We're back for our highly anticipated monthly live webcast today. We'll be diving into the intriguing topic of, of, uh, uh, of imposter syndrome. Oh my God, I felt, I, I felt like an imposter there for a minute. This learning opportunity is brought to you by none other than <laughs> Success Coaching, the world leader in customer success professional development training with close to 27,000 students hailing from nearly 100 countries. Uh, our skills development platform is truly making waves across the globe. Join us and let's conquer customer success together. Our programs offer a range of formats to suit your preferences from flexible self-paced online learning to interactive virtual instructor-led boot camps. We still have seats available for some upcoming boot camps that, won't let, uh, that you won't want to miss, including our popular CCSM Level 1 Certification Boot Camp, November 6th through 8th, and an EMEA-friendly time slot, December 4th through 6th, starting at 5 a.m. Pacific for that one. Uh, we have outcome-based selling certification boot camp next week, October 24th through 25th, but hurry on that one because we have only five seats left. Both the outcome-based selling boot camp and level one are led by my partner, uh, Aaron Thompson. Uh, we also have a CCSM level two boot camp scheduled for November 27th through 20, uh, 20th. Ninth, and uh, and that's the um, and that's going to be led by me. And the only time this year we're running a CCSM level three boot camp, October thirtieth to November first, also led by myself. Uh, to help celebrate National Career Development Month, we're offering thirty percent off any of our upcoming three day CCSM boot camps, level one, two, or three. We're also thrilled to collaborate with some exceptional partners who provide captivating content through our platform. Mark your calendars for some exciting upcoming events. Strategic Conversations Workshop on November 30th, led by the one and only Bob London, and Change Management for Customer Success, a skill that every customer success manager should possess if you really want to effectively drive adoption. That's led by Toby Lusich, and his next boot camp runs December 4th through 6th. Don't miss out. Whether you prefer self-paced learning, an intensive boot camp, an interactive workshop, or a personalized weekly coaching program. Our wide range of customer-focused programs and formats are tailored to meet the unique needs and learning preferences of everyone. If you're eager to level up your customer-facing skills, we've got the perfect program for you. So don't miss out on these amazing learning opportunities that can truly transform your professional journey. Register now and take your skills to the next level. Ashley has dropped, yes, Ashley has dropped a link to our program page and any coupons that we're offering right now to chat. You can find out more about all of our online learning and instructor-led programs and workshops at successcoaching.co. This CSM Mastermind Series is a live and unscripted discussion where we dig into a single topic relevant to customer success. No matter where you work, what your role is, or who your customers are, we've got you covered. We handpick practical and useful topics designed just for people in customer-facing roles. You can also check out our upcoming event schedule at successcoaching.co. Now, our, our next mastermind session will be November 15th, when we'll be talking about that sometimes love-hate relationship with sales. Oh boy, that's going to be that's going to be a conversation. Click on the events tab at the top of the successcoaching.co page to find out more and to register. It's also that time of year when we're planning our CSM mastermind topics for next year. So let us know what CSM mastermind topics you're interested in hearing about next year, or if you want to join us as a panelist. Ashley has also just dropped a link to in our uh, to a survey that we're we're asking you to fill out uh, in in chat. Remember, we do these webinars for you, and we would appreciate your input. Now, a few housekeeping items before we get started. This webinar is being recorded, and we will be sharing the replay and a transcription on our website early next week. During the webinar, we welcome your questions, so please don't hesitate to use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen to ask or upvote a question. We will prioritize questions based on the number of upvotes. So if you see a question that you're particularly interested in, be sure to upvote it. We are also live streaming on LinkedIn and have somebody monitoring that feed. So if you're on LinkedIn and you're watching us and you have a question, please post it and Tracy will relay it to us. While we appreciate feedback during the event, we kindly request that you use the chat window for any sort of commentary. And then the Q&A window for any sort of question. Now, there's a bunch of thought leadership out there along with 
loads of theories on how to deliver customer success. But in this series, we're going to focus on practical, real-world advice, best practices, techniques, and shared experiences from those who are actually doing customer success day in and day out. Now, to make that happen, we've invited three awesome panelists to join me for a roundtable discussion. These are folks who are really damn good at what they do, and we're going to ask them to spill the beans on their experiences and their perspectives. So without further ado, I want our panelists to introduce themselves to y'all and share a little bit about who they are and what they do. And let's get started, as usual, in alphabetical order with Janelle. <laughs> Man, I've never been at the top of the alphabetical chain. Um, thank you for that, Andrew. <laughs> Um, well, you're barely, I, you're barely there. You're, you're, barely, you're, I know you're the it, JA I know. as opposed to the JO. So, I know it. Um, yeah. Well, I'm Janelle Friday. I'm currently um, a success leader with a company called Forecastable. I'm also working with a company called Fusion. And my primary focus, to be quite frank, is helping aspiring and entry-level CSMs understand what are the soft skills needed within customer success? How can we ramp them quicker because we're building a stronger foundation? Um, and just helping kind of practitioners understand the core around customer success so that as SaaS continues to build and grow and evolve, that customer success truly does stay the heart of what we're doing because it's not a job title, it's a mindset. So i um, really thrilled to be here and thanks for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Chanel. And by the way, congratulations for getting that CS Leader of the Year <laughs> Award. Thank well, you. Well, well, well deserved. Thank you. Um, next up, Josh. Yeah. Hey, everyone. Josh Samora. I'm in San Diego. Uh, I am a customer success leader currently looking for my next role. So uh, if you're out there and you're hiring and you need a, a director, senior director, VP level, let me know. Ping me afterwards. Um, and actually, this is a perfect topic for me to join because uh, as an interviewer, as a uh, person looking for a new gig, uh, it's really easy to fall into imposter syndrome. So I feel imposter syndrome being on this call, not having a job with a good title yet. But um, we'll 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 make it through this today. So excited to be here. Thanks, Andrew. You'll you'll do just fine. And you are definitely not an imposter. Uh, I've known you for <laughs> for a long time. We've been we've known each other for a minute. Yeah, it's yes, been great. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And and so thanks, Josh. And last but certainly not least, my friend Tiffany. Hi everyone. I am Tiffany Timmerman. Um, never likely to win the alphabetical order lottery, whether you use <laughs> first name or last name. Um, I am the Director of Customer Success at Onboard. Uh, we are a tech amenities platform based in Salt Lake City. I've been out here for about three and a half years now after about a decade in the Atlanta tech scene uh, where I spent time at um, Unicorn Sales Off in Calumny, building out customer success organizations from the ground up. Um, it did spur a niche interest in building and rebuilding customer experience functions. So whether it's um, true CS or implementation, support, professional services, education and enablement, uh, customer ops, you name it. Um, I've had my hand in that area of the business. Prior to that, I practiced family and personal injury law in Georgia. Um, and throughout all that experience from front lines to leadership, I've had to manage my own expectations about my worthiness and qualification to do what I do. Um, so I'm very excited to be here today and share how managing imposter syndrome has played a role in my customer success journey um, with some personal tips and tricks that I hope are helpful for those watching as they have been for my own CSM's professional growth. Awesome. Thanks, Tiffany. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, you had a very interesting path into customer success, getting your JD and, and actually practicing law. So uh, I, I always in, always interested in seeing those, those uh, non-traditional paths into customer mm -hmm. success. But then again, those non-traditional paths are becoming kind of more traditional, aren't they? Yeah. yeah. Uh, awesome. Once again, thank you all. Uh, appreciate your time today. Let's get now to the topic at hand. Um, so today we're diving deep in, into something a lot of us have felt. I mean, I myself have felt it, but might not talk about it enough. Imposter syndrome. So, so what is it? Well, it's that nagging feeling that you're not as good as people think that you are. And that any day now, you'll be found out, you'll be discovered. You know, it's it's more than just self-doubt. It can actually make you undermine your own achievement. This isn't just about you or me. It's something that can affect your whole team's vibe and performance and customer success, and therefore your customers as well. So we're going to get real about how it shows up, what it does to our work, and most importantly, how to kick it to the curb. So for those of you joining us live, 
Ashley's going to post a short survey that we'd like you to weigh in on. Have you experienced this? Have you personally experienced imposter syndrome? Oh my gosh. There's not, there's not one no yet. And we've already got how many attendees? We've got 141, got 105 answers, 100, 109 answers, all 100% yes. So clearly, this is something that everybody, see, now we're at a point where anybody who answers no. <laughs> just messing with us. Right, like right. Yeah. It's just, it's just <laughs> has to be messing with us. <laughs> exactly. Wow. <laughs> We got 121 out of 142 people answered it and 100% yes. Okay. All right. That's uh, that's awesome. Okay. I mean, it's not awesome, but I'm, thank you all. Thank you for all for, <laughs> for, for, for participating. Congratulations <laughs> on being feeling inferior. Wow. Now I feel, now I feel totally, totally. I feel awesome. That's and awesome. I feel not awesome. All right. So, so how about we start with a question that might ruffle some feathers? Are we in our roles in customer success actually feeding into our own imposter syndrome without even realizing? So I, I'll jump in on this one. I, I think uh, the, the short answer is yes, I think so. And I, I think it's the nature of customer success, right? So has customer success as, an, as a role, as an industry, it's all about influencing the success of others. And at the end of the day, if we're not helping others be successful, we often don't feel like we're being successful ourselves. But the catch-22 is that it's easy to minimize our importance and our impact and accomplishments as we're celebrating other people. So I like the analogy that I use all the time, which is like we're we're helping create other people's highlight reels while we're stuck watching our own blooper reels. Uh, it's It's like this awful experience of helping other people be great while us are in our own minds. We're kind of like, well, maybe I, you know, that was their greatness. That was their opportunity. That was their work that they put into it. So it's really easy to shunt ourselves into the background. Don't we, don't we know that? Don't, aren't you supposed to know that going into this? It's not about us. It's about the customer. Yeah. Well, I mean, we, we, we reinforce that so much that it becomes a self-fulfilling prophecy in terms of how we track our own successes. So even when it comes to the point of uh, rewarding good performance, right? How many companies out there have a CS president's club? How many companies out there have some sort of really great incentivization program for CS performance as a whole that's already built into the culture of the company without CS leaders coming in and being like, wait, 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 wait. we got to do something specific for CSMs. Yeah, I agree. It's a really unfortunate circumstance that I hope we can start to affect change in because in reality, at the front lines level, nobody at the business is better suited than a CSM to have that right to be confident. You know your customers best, you know your business and solutions best, you know what makes your service valuable to your customers, and your instincts definitely matter. Um, and you also like our intelligent people, right? So if you get poor feedback or something feeding into that, like you I think would hope to understand the difference between poor delivery and helpful feedback. I think there's also an element of the human condition that is sort of a underlining current tone to how we interact with one another. I think it's easy for us to glaze over business and say, oh, it's not personal, it's just business. But we live in the world of personal. That's what we're told to do is get personal and care about our customers and care about our coworkers. And so in your own life, if you're not confident in who you are, um, I think our society continually tells us we need more, we need to educate ourselves more, we need to buy more, you're not adequate, you need more. It's a natural feeling to feel like, yeah, I, I don't have it all together. And who who am I to be saying anything around telling other people, right, what they should be doing or, or what their advice should be. And the, the day that I was notified that I was the recipient of that award through the Customer Success Collective was the very same day I was having to address something I did wrong at my current employer. Like I literally sat in my chair and I'm like, I don't deserve this award. I'm not someone that should be, should be celebrated. Like this is horrible. And it just really reminded me of like how quickly it, how quick we are to downplay ourselves and to talk badly about ourselves and to think the worst of ourselves, because that's a really easy thing to do. So I think part of this is too, it's not just in customer success. It's a, it's part of the human condition that we all struggle with. Right. I think it's like mistakes are okay, right? But they're for learning and we have to foster 
these mm-hmm. cultures of psychological safety. Um, we shouldn't be reprimanding. We should give people feedback that can help them learn and grow and, and gain that confidence, especially yeah. for those early on in their career. Um, one of the things that I love so much about this webinar series is that the panelists are very good at the tactical takeaways. So I would expect that we'll have some great tips and tricks um, for how to overcome this specific situation as well. Like um, Janelle, you said almost like practice makes perfect, right? Um, and to look at the results of what you've accomplished, like upgrade set, contract signed, cancel saved, mm-hmm. um, all these things don't just magically happen. So give yourself the space in your day and in your evening to reflect on those things um, and feel proud about them. Take that moment. Yeah, you can't let, like Janelle, with your, your that reprimand, right? Or I'm sorry, that discussion. It wasn't necessarily a reprimand. It was a discussion. Yeah. Maybe in your mind, it was a reprimand. It was right? absolutely right. Yes. Right? But that, yeah, but, that but 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 that's you. You created that, right? Right. And and now now, it's important though. As uh, leaders, should be looking at these, like you said, opportunities as learning moments, right? Teaching moments, right? It shouldn't be a reprimand. It should be a discussion. And if it's coming across that way from the leader, right? That's a problem with the leader. But we sometimes create our own perspective on things, or everybody has their own perspective, right? And the voice in my head, or the multiple voice in my head, the voice in my head is going to be very different than the voice in your head when we're hearing the same message. So it's super important that we're not, once again, creating this problem ourselves. Yeah, I like what Lindsay said in the chat. Uh, We're conditioned as CS individuals to empathize and so easily are influenced by feelings and used to taking ownership and responsibility for shortcomings of the organization from the standpoint of the customer. So we have to deal with the crappy experience that the customer is dealing with and then take that as a personal thing on our shoulders so that even when something good comes out of that, we're still owning the, the negative impact of that. And that's reinforced all the way up. Yeah, but we have to have self, we have to, we also, there's another big, big, important piece of what, what we have, you know, in our toolbox. And that's that, that, that EQ that we're self-aware and we can exhibit self-control, right? And that's part of controlling that urge to beat ourselves up. Yes. I will actually tell that voice, get out of my head. You're the imposter. Ah, I love that. that. There's also another comment in the chat that um, I find many companies don't even know what CSS really is. And so I think there are a lot of um, CSMs out there who are not at an organization that truly embrace what CS is and what CS value is. And so you may be sitting in a role that makes you feel like an administrative assistant. It's a really difficult place to overcome and build your confidence when you don't have those open channels and leadership pouring into this CS you know, mindset. So um, I've been there. I think we've all been there. If you're currently there, I just want to encourage you that um, everything that you do for your customer, whether your organization uh, values it or um, applauds you for it, is impacting your customer in a positive way. And so rather than look at it from a big picture of what is the company doing, focus on what you can do, which is pour into your customer, pour into your team, pour into your coworkers, and find your fulfillment in those channels. Um, if if the current company structure or uh, temperament is not favorable towards the CS that you want it to be. Yep. Yeah. I look at those situations as a challenge, right? I, I don't look at them as a necessarily as a negative. It, it, it's, right. it's annoying and <laughs> uh, you know, and it can sometimes be frustrating, but you, you need to look at that as a challenge. Okay. I need to elevate us in the eyes of the rest of the company. Yep. So if, if, if I'm, and I, and I've been in plenty of situations where just the entire, whether it's called customer success or services or post sales or whatever you are called in an organization, you know, there is this, and I, I used to be considered the redheaded stepchild, even though I, I and I am a redhead, but I was considered the redheaded <laughs> yeah. stepchild, right? Because sales brought in the money and it was, it was the services team, the, the post sales team that was responsible for, for all this stuff after the sale. Well, guess what? Yeah. That doesn't fly anymore. I mean, back you know, back in the day, we would capture a tremendous amount of that revenue up front from the customer. That's no longer, it's not as important to, to just get the customer in the door as it is to keep them, right? So customer success and post sales in general plays an outsized role now in the success of companies. And 
it's important that that you understand that in your post sales role, but also that's communicated back to the rest of the company. Hmm. Yeah, evangel evangelism in customer success is not limited to leaders. It's something that needs to be communicated everywhere because it's a culture just as much as it is a role. So if we're not doing that effort to evangelize, and I know that's a whole separate topic, but if we're not doing our part to evangelize what CS value actually looks like and what it means to customers, then we're missing an opportunity. And then that does feed into that imposter syndrome for our team members, for our, our coworkers, for our peers. Yeah, it is a separate topic. But once again, to your point, it 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 breeds that imposter syndrome. Yeah. It creates that, it can create that situation. So we've talked about a couple of different ways that imposter syndrome manifests itself. Any other, any other glaring ways that it can manifest itself? Do any of you have a story where maybe you, you know, an experience where you you felt that imposter syndrome that uh, can you know maybe illustrates how that how that 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 cropped up in your world? I can jump in right off the bat. So um, the last time I was unemployed for a good stretch of time, um, I had been let go from a company as a director of customer success. And anyone knows that making forward momentum in your career is just, it's like one of those things that you want to have continually happening and always something that you're striving for in the process. And uh, being let go was a really just big ego blow. It, it hit me because my identity had been tied up in this role that I had taken and the the type of work that I was doing. So I was unemployed for about seven months previously. Uh, this was back in 2017. And um, I ended up taking a job as an individual contributor, even though I had been a director before. Worked out that the salary was great. It was wonderful. Um, but the role that I took was at a really very technical company. We were selling cloud computing and database structure for um, IT departments. Um, very, very technical, a lot of jargon, a lot of un un understanding of database structure that I had no clue about. Um, so I'm walking in from being a leader to being an IC to now not knowing what the technology actually does, how people talk about it, what sorts of feelings you're supposed to have around it, how to communicate with the customers around all that process. It took me a good six months to a year to really get to a point where I felt comfortable enough to talk about the business that we were selling, to talk about the business problems that we were trying to solve. Um, and it's funny how that nagging voice in the back of your head says, well, you're just never going to figure it out. You're never going to understand all the things. And for me, that took a while to get over. But the the happy end of that story is that uh, I ended up being a president's club. I ended up uh, building out the customer success ops role, um, building out the uh, working with our enablement team to do some of the stuff, Tiffany, that you were mentioning, right? Enabling CSMs to come in and do a good job in their work because of the of the lack of knowledge that I had, it made me that much more uh, wanting to help others be successful. So I think one of the things that I took out of that experience, and we'll talk about it when we talk about solutions or tips, is getting having uh, imposter syndrome isn't a, uh, a terminal illness. It's not something that you don't you don't come back from. It's something that you do come back from very, very strongly. And a lot of times that motivation comes from the fact that you don't want other people to suffer through that same experience. So as a leader now, my focus is on how do I help minimize that experience for my team members, whether it's through knowledge share, whether it's through creating opportunities for growth. Um, that is the ultimate goal for, for me as a leader is like, I want to help other people not have to deal with that experience. They're going to do it anyways, but still, if I can minimize those opportunities for them, that, that's even better. And you can't control whether they do or not, right? No, um, no. At the end of the day, you are hired for a reason. You're not a fraud. And as you know, hiring managers, I think it's important that we convey that to our teams when they're trying to get ramped up. Um, some feedback that was given to me personally um, when I was receiving some constructive feedback and taking it very hard was um, to to reframe the narrative around. Um, how that standard got set to begin with, right? Like, did someone tell you that you needed to learn a certain amount of industry knowledge by a certain time? Yes mm -hmm. or no. Um, if you felt like you weren't on track, did you feel like you could bring it up? Um, and to just not be as hard on yourself in those situations, um, just be realistic, right? Like, 
ask yourself, what's the worst that could happen if this wasn't met or if I had to bring it to someone's attention? Weigh that against the benefit of not burning out, trying to be perfect, which I can honestly say I've probably come pretty close to um, several times. And having this very candid conversation has forced me when I start to feel like that again to reevaluate how I got there to begin with. Do you know? You got anything to add? <laughs> Um, I mean, there's a question, uh, in the poll that says how much of imposter syndrome is tied to depression, anxiety, massive. Uh, I have suffered from anxiety most of my adult life. Um, at one point went through severe trauma in 2020, it was debilitating. And I had to really dig deep to figure out who am I? What is the value that I bring to my husband, to my family, to my friends, to work. And then that was kind of my baseline, right? So to think that if I make a mistake, I'm a failure, like this recent example I shared, um, my husband had to come alongside and help encourage me because it really got me down. And it took someone that knew me well enough to say, hey, remember that baseline that we set about who you are and your value and right all these things. So um, I think most of us struggle with some form of depression, anxiety, and yes, imposter syndrome, when you don't address it and you let the roll away thoughts go day after day after day without directly addressing what's the root cause, then yeah, I think imposter syndrome is a massive contributor to your mental health. And so for me, right, it's, I, I love talking about concepts, but I'm very like applicable day in the life. How do you apply this? So I think sometimes the smallest things can create the biggest impacts. And so I have sticky notes everywhere. Uh, I have sticky notes in my mirror, in my bathroom that remind me I have like <laughs> in bold, you know, customer success because I doubt it some days, right? I have a post-it note that says you are worthy of success. You are worthy of love because I need to remind myself of that. And when you don't keep what's important in front of you from a visual perspective with constant reminders, you forget, we get bogged down in daily life. We get freaked out by what's happening at work or mistakes that we make. Yep. And so I've come to understand that if I don't keep it in front of me, I, I get off track. Um, and so that's one way that I've figured out for myself that works to really help me. And I love that you went into the mental health component of this, because I think there's so much that we try to do solo of like, I'm an island, I'm on an Island. I can't figure that. I mean, we saw the poll results earlier, right? hundred percent of the people have gone through this experience. It's so isolating. It's so damn hard to try and quote unquote, pu pull yourself up by your bootstraps and try to figure out what what's wrong with you at some level. Right. Because it does feel like something's wrong. With you. And th there's two things that I'm taking away from what you're saying, Janelle, right? Number one is you have to remind yourself. Number one, you have to remind yourself that you do have the capacity for excellence, for success, for all these things. But number two, and this is something that, that a lot of times we forget is that it's okay to accept viewpoints from outside of us that will reinforce the the things that we forgot in our in our own depression in our own anxiety in our own imposter syndrome we we get stuck in that pit of wallowing a little bit and we don't let others from the outside actually help us out so that's great thank you i think i think um this is some 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 good strategies and let's talk more about strategies and on, on, on how to overcome this. Um, mm -hmm. I, um, I'll let you know a little secret. Uh, I, I have imposter syndrome regularly when I'm get when I get up and I teach and I, I've developed this content. I live this stuff. Right. And sometimes I'll get up in front of a group uh, in person or virtually, and I'll be like, okay, am I, why, why do they want to listen to me? Even though I'm <laughs> the one that actually authored the content. Right? It happens to everybody. It happens to mm -hmm. everybody from people that are just just starting out to seasoned veterans like we are. Right. That's mm -hmm. the that's the the one thing to remember. Now I I will I do something similar, Janelle. Before I get up and I do like a workshop, I go out and stand in front of the mirror and I say that. I have kind of this I recite to myself. Okay, you know mantra you know kind this, of the mantra thing. Yes. Yeah. Huh? Mantras. Hey, you know this, you understand this, you got this dialed in. Um, the other thing that I have found really helpful is I make space for myself every single day. Yes. I, I walk away and I say that at the end of every coaching call that I do on my Thursday coaching calls that we do for, for, for USF, uh, at the end of every call, at the end of every boot camp day, 
I, I got to make space for yourself. Go out, take a walk, go have lunch with a friend, go listen to music, do yoga, whatever it is, right? Mm-hmm. You need to make that space. The, the more space you make for yourself in your day, the easier it is going to be for you to, to be more self-aware, exhibit more self-control, be able to handle these thoughts. Mm-hmm. What, works for, what works for each of you? When it comes to kind of dealing with that, those, those feelings. Um, I'll throw in just an actual like physical reset before big events. Um, I will actually do a handful of burpees, not too many because we still don't love them. Um, I actually did probably 10 about an hour ago. I was going to ask if you did them before. Uh, (laughs) Webinar. Um, But I think, you know, at the end of the day too, it's just like making sure that I give myself adequate time to prepare burpees being a part of that. If there's, you know, space or the appropriate forum, um, but practice makes perfect enough. Um, I have to tell myself that I don't have to anticipate every hole that could be poked, which the legal, you know, background in me definitely overthinks. Um, but, you know, and I tell this to my teams too get hands-on, internalize your talk tracks, become comfortable with the words coming out of your mouth, um, and then kill the question mark. Go from, can I do this to, I can do this and just own it and go in. So wait, you mentioned, I'm sorry, Josh, before you go, uh, before, before, before you go, Tiffany, you mentioned um, uh, handling the question marks before you go in. So, so preparation, being prepared. Yeah. is is uh, really helpful when it comes to to dealing with imposter syndrome. Yeah, and it's it's tricky, right? Because in our worlds, we can plan what we hope will be the perfect day, but we know it will almost never go that way. Um, so I suggest building in time to your calendar to handle those more reactive activities or build in time as much as possible to make sure that the things that will really move the needle of the business or your career have the time that they deserve to go well. Prep, 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 prep. Mm-hmm. Make and sure it's, you're prepping. And it's not just work stuff either. Um, this this applies to the personal relationships and to day to day challenges too. Tiffany, you said something kind of interesting during our prep call, and you referenced Ted Lasso. Um, oh, that was Janelle. Oh, that was oh, Janelle. Oh, that was Janelle. <laughs> <I'm> t- <laughs> all right. Well, Janelle, I'm stealing your thunder then and hey. re- reattributing it. Sorry. Yeah. Um, you want to <laughs> share that because I love that scene and I love what you were talking about there. Great. Yeah. So in Ted Lasso, the owner of this women, uh, this men's soccer club is a woman. She's a scorned ex-wife whose husband left her for a younger woman. And she's a, t- a club owner amidst all of these men who, who are club owners. Right. So one of her, one of the characters in the show asks her, how do you handle going in as the only woman in the room? How do you exude confidence? And she goes, I stand in front of a mirror and I get as big as I can in the mirror and I scream at the mirror and go, Whoa! myself and it just makes me feel like yeah I got this I own this and I just love that because specifically we talk about women and how to overcome this as women in business because there's still some traction there that we need to have but it's a it's a very raw perspective of it doesn't matter what it is it doesn't matter what it takes what it what is it that feeds your soul what is it that gets you excited and um to Josh's point right that Sometimes it's the stupidest thing, like screaming at yourself in the mirror and making yeah. yourself look big, but like it worked. Right. And I, I, so I have to admit, I did try it. It didn't work for me. <laughs> I ended up laughing at myself for forever. And my husband's like, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm he's like, oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it's I funny. like uh, that. That's great. I, Roy, Roy dropped something in chat. And by the way, I want to get some questions here. But Roy dropped something in chat. One thing that helps me, I've come to the point where I don't have to know all the answers. That actually empowers me as a CS professional. Yeah, yeah Roy, that's a that's a great that's a great call out. It's something that uh, that I learned back in the day, even before customer success. It's okay for me to say, "Hey, you know what? I need to look into that more." Hey, I need to. I you don't have to know all the questions. Now, I came up with a creative way to approach. It is opposed to saying, I don't know, which can sometimes lead to some doubt on the, on the uh, side of the, on the customer side. Um, I, I spin it a little bit and say, you know what, I've got an idea, but I want to go check with somebody to validate what my idea is. I could have no idea whatsoever, but as far as the customer knows, I've got an idea, mm-hmm. right? And that gives me the, the, that extra time, that, that, that space to be able to go 
and 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 validate what I'm thinking or actually just get an answer from somebody without admitting that I have no clue. I want to go back on something real quick Janelle said in one of the questions that came up um, from Olga. I think that it's it's not just women for sure. Like the 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 dynamics of being a woman in tech are like I can't even imagine uh, the challenges. But I can relate from a certain point, right? So I'm a first generation American. Um, I was born here. My parents were immigrants from Mexico, and that that imposter syndrome hits on a few different levels. It's not just do you know your stuff? It's do you belong in the space? Do you feel like you belong in the space? Uh, I'm not an average white guy, right? Like, and I, I hate to use that terminology as dismissively as maybe it sounds. Um, I'm not just the old white guys club. That's just not who I am. That's not been what part of my experience has been. So getting into positions of leadership, getting into positions of authority and, and accountability has made me much more, um, feel a lot more insecure about whether or not I have a place there. Um, and I think that anyone who is having to deal with that sense of, do I belong here? Do I, do I even have a voice that is worth sharing? Do I even have ideas that are worth sharing? All these tips are, are wonderful and they, they're going to help us do that sort of stuff. But at the, at a certain point, you have to make up your mind that um, you are going to do this regardless of that feeling. The feelings are going to pass, but the activities that you do are the things that are that actually matter in the process. And, and once again, to it's you. Too. Sorry, it's all about sorry. you. No, no, go ahead, Janelle. I was going to say to build off that too. I think um, as I work with people that I'm coaching and working with, right there's a there's a generalized feeling of like, what does it take to be successful in a CS role? And I think yeah. it's very simple. If you are an individual who cares about your fellow man and you're willing to work hard to help an individual get to where they want to go, then you belong in CS. And all of the nuances from one company to another or the structure or the processes can change along the way. But to your core, if that's who you are and you like to learn about people, um, and an example is walking into Costco, right? Going to get the Atari. This guy comes out of Costco with a Seattle Seahawks sweatshirt on. I'm from Seattle. I was like, hey, Seahawks, you know? And my husband goes, I think you just look for reasons to talk to people that you don't know. And I was like, <laughs> yes, I do. And that's why I'm good at what I do. Because That's I how we met, you know. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> so, I mean, I think when you know that's who you are and I stay very confident in that is who I am. It's what I'm, I'm yeah. that way with my family, with my friends, then I know that I'm going to thrive in customer success. And so learning how to have difficult conversations, learning how to build a deck, learning how to run an executive business review, learning how to balance and shift priorities and make sure everybody has what they need. That's that's a lifetime of learning within the field that we're in. But I think to your core, if you can identify that's how you are, then you belong in customer success. Yeah, this is something that my daughter I'm regularly sorry. gives me grief on um, because we'll be we'll be places and <laughs> I, I will I will just start talking to folks and she yeah. just rolls her eyes and she's like, oh my god, my dad knows people. Ever I'm like, I don't yeah. know these people. I'm just. You know, I, I'm, I'm just meeting folks. I'm going up and saying hi. It's just part of kind of who I am, right? It's even and worse when someone is, has is a I, dog. Pardon? <laughs> it's even worse for me if someone has a dog. Oh, yeah. If somebody has I'm a lost. dog, if they're wearing if they're wearing a Grateful Dead shirt, you know, I'm always yeah. walking up to deadheads going, hey, did you go to that show? Blah, 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 blah. You know, and my daughter's just, she just rolls her eyes. Like, oh, my God, Dad, you're so embarrassing. Um, but uh so so let's 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 uh I'm sorry Tiffany you had something else to say and then we'll we'll take some questions. Yeah, um and I'll just throw one in for the introverts and the semi introverts on that line is um I love seeing other people engage that way but it's definitely not my comfort zone. Um but I think there's a there's like a common thread with I think what we're saying here as far as um, social engagement with what we do in customer success, which is good old social proof. So another way to kind of like give yourself a reset on the things going on in your head is to get that objective third party validation. Um, this could include friends, family, professional network, mentors, the Seahawks guy at Costco, um, <laughs> maybe not him. Um, but <laughs> it is a great space, uh, that's, you know, safe to talk through your fears and just have that like backup voice of reason when you need it. I love, I I, I love, love that. that. I love calling out. You don't have to be an extrovert. I think no. you said it like that, right. We, it's a balance. And I love people that are not extroverts because I learned so much from how you approach things, how you manage things. And 
learning how to listen more, right? You guys, I think sometimes introverts are so amazing at listening, which is a skill set that some of us have to really learn how to actively listen. So I love that you called that out. Oh, my wife's a big introvert. So yeah, being aware of that social battery draining, like you could see it on her face across the room. We're in a, at a group and it's like, oh yeah, it's time to go. <laughs> we got to go. have my moments. Yeah. I, I'm actually, <laughs> I, I'm, I'm, I'm actually, um, I'm right on the line. I'm an introvert extrovert. Mm -hmm. I, I am Ambivert. definitely, yeah. I am, I, even though nobody oh, believes yeah. me, I am me not an extrovert. I am an introvert. I am more introvert than extrovert. Uh, but you know, you kind of get, especially when you're in this role, even before customer success, I was kind of, I, I threw myself into this role of, of forcing myself to interact with folks and be, cause I knew that that was kind of part of the journey that I wanted to take. Uh, mm -hmm. interestingly enough, my, my son who very much, he's a huge introvert. My son is is, is uh, 23, and he works for Zoom Info in in research. Um, but when he was much younger, super introvert, hated going out. He's a gamer, so he's an extrovert virtually, but he's an introvert, you know, personally. And uh, he got a job. He went and took a job at Starbucks down the street. So, you know, to, to work during high school and, and during his first couple of years of college. Uh, and and I, I questioned him on that. I'm like, I'm really surprised you took the job at Starbucks. And he said, well, you know, I needed to, I knew that I had to deal with people in life. So I pushed myself, right? I pushed myself mm -hmm. to, to and, and, and that meant getting into a role that I wasn't comfortable doing. And he ended up staying at Starbucks before he moved up to Vancouver. He, he ended up staying at Starbucks for like two and a half years and was one of their top baristas you know and and then this is my introverted kid that was really uh that. was really mind-blowing so hey let's take some questions um as a reminder we're gonna go another half an hour here we go till 15 past the hour if you can't stick around it and you have to leave at the top of the hour we will be posting this recording and transcription on the website but if you can stick around we will answer as many questions as we can between now and 12 15 pacific so uh first question kind of playing off of and josh Josh touched on it a bit before, but Ola asks, I would love to hear from Tiffany and Janelle how they have managed imposter syndrome as women in tech. Tiffany, you want to go first? Um, sure. Um, <laughs> it's an it's an ongoing thing that I, you know, have had to be mindful of. I think more so than gender oriented though i think it it just really comes down to tiffany oriented um so i do the things that i mentioned earlier in the webinar um practicing um giving myself a bit of a reset and then you know just being comfortable and taking command of the knowledge that i have knowing that i am more knowledgeable and experienced at what i do and how it impacts the business than probably most everybody else at the business and to just make sure that, you know, as a, as a leader, I'm bringing the data that backs up those sentiments as well. And that I know them inside and out. Yeah. And I would say, I mean, I definitely have struggled with finding my voice in, as a woman in business. I think a lot of times I'm someone who deals very directly. I speak directly. I, I don't do a lot of small talk or beat around the bush. I like action. I like forward thinking application. Um, and so I've been labeled as aggressive, hostile. <laughs> There's been all these words used when I'm like, it was just a direct conversation. Direct conversations are not good or bad. They're just direct. And it's how I come across. And so I think as a woman, I tend to say, this is just me in business. And if I was a guy, nobody would be saying anything, but because I'm a female, I'm labeled this way and it's frustrating. But I've also come to the perspective of, I also am, have not always been mindful of how I come across and, and really thinking about my audience before I deliver what I want to say and reformulating and, and being flexible in how I'm delivering and how I'm engaging and how I'm interacting. Um, and so I think it's, it's both, right? We have to be cognizant that yes, I'm a leader and yes, I have a voice, but at the same time, you can lead a horse to water, but you can't make him drink. And if you're dragging that horse to the drop, chances are he's not going to drink. So it is in the approach and the delivery um, that we, I think, need to be more mindful of. And is it fair? No, it's just the way it is. I just wow, Janelle, I feel oh, you're being really aggressive right now. 
Andrew. <laughs> no, but on, on, but seriously though, I think I think that's uh, it, it, I love that. Love what both of you said, but I also I think everybody, it doesn't matter what gender you are, you need to be aware of who you're talking to and you need yeah. to adjust, you know, the way you're talking. It's not just what you say, it's how you say it. Yeah. And I, right? I think it, so, it comes with a comfort with nuance. Uh, Janelle, you, you kind of hit on it a little bit, right? It's, it's not just a one-sided thing that I, because I'm a woman, because I'm this, because I'm that, then all of a sudden that, you know, it's the world against me. Um, there's nuance to life and we have to get comfortable with nuance and get comfortable with the gray areas and be comfortable with being able to put ourselves out when it's not fair, when it's not ideal, when it's not perfect. Um, yeah. so I, I love, I love how you both responded on this. Thank you guys very much for that too. It's funny in preparation for this or not preparation necessarily, but leading up to this discussion, I actually, um, the Instagram algorithm God served me a very timely meme. Um, and I'm just going to read it because I think it's important to <laughs> acknowledge that it is a gender agnostic statement. Um, but it's set, you know, just a quote, an app where you can transfer your imposter syndrome to people who shouldn't be in positions of power. And it just really made me giggle because I, you know, reflected back on certain moments in my career. And I was like, yeah, that would have been really cool to just like push a button. <laughs> I think I've shared that like five times. Yeah, I'd pay for that <laughs> app. I would pay for that app. <laughs> so many times I could yeah. use that. It's solid $4.99. Uh-huh. Love that. Least. That's a freaking bargain. Four hundred ninety-nine bucks. That's a bargain. Oh, four dollars and ninety-nine cents. Okay, that's even, even that's even, even well, better. Four hundred ninety-nine bucks would be a bargain too. Uh, awesome, Olga. Thank you for the question. Um, our next question comes from Sarah. Sarah asks, I've been doing a very similar role to customer success without the title for the past four to five years. I just passed the CCSM level one exam. Awesome. Good for Yay. you. And I'm applying for CSM jobs. However, I feel like I'm not a real CSM because I don't currently have the title. So why would they hire me? Being rejected by companies or not hearing back feels like reinforcement. What recommendation, recommendations do you have for new CSMs to gain confidence and highlight experience? And yes. I'm all over this one because this is what I do, right? So I think we need to acknowledge a shift in the market when it comes to recruiters. We used to build a resume that describes what we did. That's, that's no longer. A resume now is focused on what did you achieve and what are your accomplishments? And so um, there's scientific backed um, industry knowledge of what should it look like a resume look like because traditionally, right, a recruiter would read through. Now, because there are what, 800 to 1,000 applicants within the first 48 hours, they're taking your resume and they're laying it on top of a computer program and the job description and they're looking for, for matches. And if you don't match 80% or higher, you probably won't even get a response. And so we have to reshift how we look at how do you present yourself? It's not about describing what you did. It's about describing what did you accomplish that would make them want to pay attention to you. And so if you have a job that you don't have a CS title, but in the in your accomplishments, you're describing actions that sit under the umbrella of customer success, that's how I would recommend you approach your resume. And, and you may find that it will get you further down the road. I hundred percent agree. And, and remember we, we used to do recruiting and it was something, you know, when we, we used recruiting and consulting to fund the development of our training program. And one of that was, that was coaching I gave to applicants, you know, six years ago, you need to forget. We don't, we don't need to, you, to, you to write war and peace on, on your job role. You need to stick with, here are some bullets. This is what I did and what it meant. I think about it, Sarah, you, you just passed CCSM level one. Remember in the success plan, we talk about quantifiable outcomes, right? The importance of quantifiable outcomes for your customers. So you need to think about it in that sense. I did this and it resulted in this and be in, 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 in list those quantifiable outcomes as detailed as possible. I implemented this program and it, and it resulted in this amount of retention, right? You know, things like that. So Janelle nailed it, right? She nailed it. Um, the, the other thing is also, I think, uh, and Janelle, you can, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think there's uh, uh, something to be said about how you position yourself in your cover letter as well. But, even if you very don't much have so. A, yeah, yeah. Even though you don't have a customer success title, you need to explain, I was doing all this customer success stuff. 
And yeah, I, there's a very specific formula on how to write a cover letter specifically for customer success because it's difficult to quantify customer success today. Um, there's also scientific backing around how the resume is formatted. For example, recruiters like odd numbers. So if you have four bullet points under a job title, reduce it to three or increase it to five. Recruiters' brains physically light up when they see a number that starts with what your accomplishment is. So 95% customer retention rate. If that 95 is at the beginning of your description of what you accomplish under that job, a recruiter is going to pay attention. So there's a lot of knowledge out there around really how to, how to gain traction. Um, the other one is if you're applying to a job on LinkedIn and there's a recruiter or a hiring manager attached, and you're sending a message, but you're using the template that LinkedIn gave you, they're not listening. All of this is about who are you? How do you display yourself well? Because ultimately every recruiter is looking at you to say, can I put this person in front of my most important customer? And the way you present yourself and articulate yourself is a huge part of that. You're, you're telling a story and you're applying yeah. to a role that is all about storytelling. So yeah. If nothing else, the practice in the interview process, in the in the uh, resume creation, in the 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 uh, cover letter, all of that is going to be the storytelling devices that you're using to get into a storytelling role. So um, that's actually something that I'm learning in this process right now for myself. So uh, very much in the thick of it. So thank you, Janelle. That actually helped me out too. Yeah, Josh, you and I can talk later. Offline. Yeah. Yeah. I want to throw in just from a hiring manager perspective, um, because I do a lot of my hiring in the junior CSM or new career path um, spaces. Um, there is something to be said to be explicit about your transferable skills um, within those CSM competencies. So like, don't hesitate from using buzzwords like empathy, um, show you're an effective right. communicator, a collaborative problem solver, um, your, showcase your technical aptitude, um, what motivates you, um, your agility, um, you know, really understand the company um, stage of where you're applying to and how those um, competencies can help further that company getting to the next level. So startup agile, very much so. Um, yeah. Enterprise, yeah. maybe not as much on the agile side. Right. Active listening, asking Active good listening. questions. These are all important components, right? Mm -hmm. Empathy and active listening are two of your superpowers in customer success. Yeah. So don't, don't uh, forget to highlight those. Sarah, thank you for the question. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, our next question comes from Rochelle. Rochelle asks, when participating in group discussions or delivering presentations, I've noticed that my imposter syndrome often leads me to verbally undermine myself by adding phrases like, but that's just my thoughts at the end of my sentences. How can I work on overcoming this habit and instead communicate my ideas with confidence and conviction? Stop talking. Let the silence yeah. happen. <laughs> yes. <Yeah. laughs> Are, are are they just your thoughts or are they facts that you've called from information either on your own systems or out in uh, you know on the you know in 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 the web sphere or right uh, site sources right mm -hmm. here well, here is the data that's not it's not just your thoughts if you have data to back up what you're saying cite the data and that's a fact. And and I think to your point, Andrew, right, it's distinguishing the difference between a fact and an opinion. And a lot of times we 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 confuse those two. We confound them. Um, and when you get really good at dis distinguishing those things, then you can make that, like I make the joke all the time of, oh, this is just gospel according to Josh, right? This is something that I believe in. It's my opinion. It's something that is not necessarily fact-driven, but this is going to validate the fact that I'm going to provide to you as part of my discussion. So learn to distinguish those two things and then be able to leverage some uh, leverage your personality in the process of it. Mm -hmm. I'd also argue though, that your frontline's instincts are also a valid data point. If you are looking at the totality of the circumstance and your experience. Yep. Yeah. I'm actually part of um, Nils uh, Vinjay's leadership MBA program. And so literally last week we covered how to deliver your recommend how to deliver what you want to say in a way that other people will hear. And so his term is I recommend because you're coming from a place of authority and knowledge, but you're not forcing other people to accept it as fact. It's a recommendation. And so they can, there's 
basic responses. They can either agree with you, completely disagree with you, in which case they'll probably take the ownership from you, or they'll ask more questions to better understand where you're coming from. And then the other term is risk. So instead of presenting a problem, have you ever heard of, don't bring me a problem, bring me a solution, right? It's yeah. you're identifying risks. So you're saying, here's my recommendation because these are the outlier risks that I think we should consider. And it's a completely different delivery process and how people receive that to then interact with you and see you in a light of you are coming from a place of authority. And as a manager, that's one of the best things I can hear is someone yeah. who who assesses the risk, understands the situation and can actually come up with a, a plan of attack. Um, it's it it's the best thing that you can get out of your team members. And also, you know, doesn't hurt to come up with a couple of different plans, right? We could do this or we could do this. Yep. Yeah. Right? Right. And, and, and in this plan, you got these benefits, but you got these risks, this other plan, you got these benefits, but you got these risks, put the onus on the customer to make the decision, right? Here, my recommendation is X, but here's an alternative. Yes. Right? You're giving yeah. them, you're giving them options. Uh, the other thing, Rochelle, that I would recommend is uh, Janelle's post-it note uh, strategy, right? Just write on a post-it note. It's not just my thoughts, right? Or it's, you know, or I recommend, right? Just yeah. to remind yourself, there's nothing wrong with that. I'll also go back to earlier in the conversation where we kind of talked about just being realistic. Um, you could have the best recommendation, but there may be other things going on at your customer's business or your business that you're not aware of, where it just might not make sense at this time. And just, you know, give yourself the grace to not take rejection personally, but if it's something that you feel strongly or passionately about, um, you know, keep tracking the development and progress and bring an update um, and maybe reiterate or amend your recommendation. And that's a great point, Tiffany. That's yeah. something that I've, I've talked about before is this notion of, of watermelon accounts. There are things happening. Your account may be seen green, but it's red on the inside and you have no clue what's going on. Yeah. And that's, that is not a reflection on you, mm -hmm. right? That just is, th th there are watermelon accounts in everybody's book of business, right? Right. That is not necessarily a reflection on you. So now, if your book of Good business term. is entirely watermelon accounts, well, maybe it is, <laughs> maybe it's a reflection <laughs> on you. Okay. But there are outliers everywhere and don't beat yourself up when one of those watermelons explodes and, and, and your customer your customer walks away. You need to just you know, learn from it and move on. Yeah. Um, Rochelle, thank you for the question. Our next, and, re and reminder, we'll keep going here for another 15 minutes. Our next question comes from Elizabeth. Elizabeth asks, it's no secret that there have been massive layoffs in tech. How do you manage feeling like an imposter because you feel like you should have been laid off? Oof. Should have or shouldn't have? I think she said should she have. Should have. Yeah. It's like survivor's remorse or survivor's guilt. <clears throat> well, one thing I want, I want people to remember is these massive, a, a lot of these massive layoffs in tech were the result of tech companies way over hiring. Yeah. You know, I, and, and you also need to look at who's laying off, right? Real estate, uh, a bit, uh, 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 blockchain, uh, you know, a bunch of these, a bunch of these, these, um, uh, these technologies that uh, really over oh, kind of oversold themselves. Um, and, and then there was even like the Google and the Facebooks or, or Meta as they're called now, who hired a bunch of people to get them off the market, right? So, you know, there's been a correction. I remember back in the day, you know, 15, 20 years ago, uh, a culling 10%, 15% of the workforce on a yearly basis was a standard thing, right? I, I felt this on both, both sides of the equation, Elizabeth. So I think the, the survivor's guilt or survivor's remorse that comes from, oh, well, yeah, they got fired. They're much better than I am. Why would I still be around here? Right. And I, I think that that's such a, um, there's a sense of humility that comes with that, right? Like I recognize that I am privileged to be in a role. I'm, I've got a great job. I'm happy that I'm here. Like that sort of stuff is great. But then there's the darker side of that where you feel lesser than as a result of comparisonisms, right? And I think that that term right there, that comparison that you do with others is where my analogy earlier of the blooper reel versus the other people's highlight reel really comes into play. 
It is easy to see your own mistakes and to blow them out of proportion to other people's successes um, because you interpret their successes as inherent to them as a person and you interpret your failures as an inherent value of you as a person. So when you personalize those things, whether that's attributing to somebody else or, or blaming yourself as an individual, then you are creating a circumstance under which you, you lessen your value. And one of the things that I've had to do is, uh, and this is actually one of the tips I was going to give um, earlier, which was I write down, I have, I've got a, a notebook. It's not, a, not here handy with me, but I've got a notebook of things that I've accomplished. It's not my resume. It's not my cover letter. These are things that I wrote down specifically in my own hand that show me that I have value to my role, that I have value in my life. I have value in the accomplishments that I've done and having that handy helps eliminate that sense of overinflated um, uh, disregard of my own abilities, of my own uh, successes. And that might help with a little bit of that sense of guilt of like, well, I, I survived, they didn't. Why should I be still, why should I still be here? Um, that can help out a little bit. And I love that, Josh. Sorry, Tiffany, go ahead. Oh no, Janelle, all you. Uh, I was just going to say, uh, my husband has picked up a mantra and he'll probably get mad at me for saying this, but one of his mantras is I no longer carry the things that do not serve me. So my question, um, Elizabeth is does feeling like an imposter because you weren't laid off, does that serve you? Why do we hold on to things that we know are not good for us? And it's a constant self-evaluation for me. It's daily daily asking myself, what am I carrying that doesn't serve me? And that's not to say I'm going to ignore things that I should. It's, right. it's asking direct questions about yourself. So the ability to let go of things that are harmful, there's no reason to carry those on. It's you're grateful for uh, the role. You want to support your coworkers that were laid off that need help finding a job and you move forward. But by carrying that with you, you're you're basically your own worst enemy. And so, you know, finding sayings like I choose to let go of the things that don't serve me. My husband has radically transformed the way he views himself because he's proactively asking himself that every day and applying it. And so I would just encourage you to find something, a saying, find your own mantra, put it on a sticky note, put it on your vision. I have a massive vision board above my monitors, put it up there so that you constantly, when you're in that moment, you're looking, going, that's right. I'm letting go of things that don't serve me and just say it over and over. And your, your brain is habitual, just like your body is habitual. 43 days cr creates a new habit. So if you say it out loud for 43 days, chances are you're probably going to believe it after a while. So just to 43 days. I read a study that was closer to 65 days. Uh, well, I, so this is one of part of my coaching um, program. And I just, I have an article that says, well, published. I don't know, about a month ago, Andrew, and it says it's it's traditionally 43 days if you're verbally saying something out loud hmm. for the brain. Okay. Will, you, will you drop that in? Sure. Email that to me. Sure. Yes, yeah. happy to. <laughs> I did a bunch of I did a bunch of bunch of research on that actually. It's at some yes. point, so I would be very interested in in uh, hearing that or in wanna, about that. Tiffany, what did you want to add? Yeah, to I just want to like quickly tack on with this question um again being realistic and just telling that voice in your head there are so many nuances that go into decisions like this that may or may not have anything to do with you or the person that unfortunately did experience the layoff and you know again control what you can control right like there's nothing you can do about it now so make the most of the opportunity that you have to like really shine and step up for the business if that is what you want to do which I think a lot of us here are just naturally inclined to do. Um, and then on the more tactical side, I know we're talking about, you know, collecting our own sediments and accomplishments, but I do want to bring back the social proof too. also grab screenshots of positive feedback, start building a repository from coworkers, from customers, um, bosses, whoever it may be that you can just take with you on your career journey and go back and reflect on what those moments were and how good it made you feel at that time. And then try to like, just experience some of that um feeling good again i, I want to add one more thing on this and that's fantastic tiffany because i think we it's, paul set it up a little bit earlier on the chat right we we look at key uh, 
like very catered versions of ourselves on LinkedIn or on Instagram or on other social media. So it's really easy to see this very curated view of Josh Zamora on Instagram or on, on LinkedIn, actually not so much on Instagram. Um, but the, the experience of, of projecting our failures on other people's successes is, is really, really critical. Um, one of the things that, that I also like to do, and, um, I joke about this with my kids. It's the 10, 10, 10, 10, 10, 10 rule, right? Is this something that's going to impact me in 10 minutes, 10 days, or 10 weeks it, or some other scale of reference, right? Is this something I can solve? Is it something that's going to be a problem? Is it something that I need to worry about within some 10 minutes, 10 days, 10 hours, 10 weeks, 10 months, whatever. And then that gives me a little bit more perspective on whether or not this is something that's super critical and I need to work on right now or something that I can sit on and wait for a little bit. Imposter syndrome can fit within that realm as well, where you can be like, yeah, I feel bad that these layoffs happen and, I've, and I'm going to mourn, you know, frankly, and mourn the losses of people in our, in our community, in our work community. But is it something that's really going to be something that I can change in the next 10 minutes? Is it something that I am going to be able to change in the next 10 hours or next 10 days? If I can't, I, I don't have any reason to worry about it at this point in time, right? Do you give it the okay. due time, the due focus, and then move on. Otherwise, you will get stuck in that. Yeah, I love that, Josh. Yeah, that's great. Don't get caught. Don't get don't don't get stuck in it. Um, Elizabeth, thank you for the uh, question. Hopefully that uh, that helped you a bit. Um, so here's here's one. Um, and Josh, you and I, I think you and I actually talked about this mm -hmm. in uh, one of our in a moment of truth recording. Um, I have recently taken on a more senior CSM role, which puts me in a position of managing uh, or otherwise leading my peers, whom I still consider friends. Do you have any suggestions on how to manage imposter syndrome in situations like this? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I mean, this this is a tough one, right? Because, and, and this goes back to what I said earlier, all of life is nuance. All of life that we deal with is a gray area. So we have to figure out what are, what are the areas that we're going to allow ourselves to be um, acting in a certain role based off of the circumstances that we're in. Um, I don't think there's a silver bullet answer to this. I think this is what I've taken from my experiences. Um, at the end of the day, in work, we are accountable to each other and we're accountable to our business. We're accountable to our customers. That accountability is the framework under which our behaviors are going to take shape. So I can still be friends with people and at the same time, still hold them accountable for things that they're responsible for, especially as the role has changed. And that's probably the hardest thing to do is, is creating that balance between we're friends, but we're also going to be held accountable to this stuff. And that's where communication really comes into play, right? If you're not communicating why you're changing your approach on certain things, then all of a sudden you're going to create hurt feelings. You're going to create bad situations. You're going to create circumstances under which that uh, miscommunication and, and misunderstandings can arise. Um, so set the right accountability structure and communicate about it early, often, frequently, because uh, you, will, you will help alleviate some of that angst in the moment. Tiffany, Janelle, anything to add? Um, we covered leadership in this class that I'm in with Nils, and he gave a really amazing description of what is a leader. So a leader is someone who does everything possible to make sure everyone is successful. So if your role on this team is to lead the team, it means that you're not focused on, um, yes, uh, corporate metrics are important and you're meeting those goals. But I think those goals are accomplished because you're investing in each one of your team members to figure out what do they need? What drives them? How do you, how do you encourage them, inspire them, make sure that they're hitting their goals and they're being successful. And then the whole team is successful. So rather than feel like, who am I to lead them? Instead, you're taking that personal time to invest in who they are and what their goals are um, to help them thrive. And my personal mantra is we rise by helping others. So if you hope to be a great leader, I think it's how you view your position and how you view the, the team around you. Yeah. Definitely. I think that's how I was able to get the most out of my team. So I would walk into a new role in a leadership role. And the first thing I would tell people is, hey, my job is to help you do your job. 
That's help right. you do do what you need to do as best as possible. I like right? saying because no their their success begets your success. Yep. Right? I'm no longer a CSM, I'm an ESM employee success manager. And that yeah. changes the that. dynamic of how Ooh, I approach. ESM. Yep. I like that. Can we coin that phrase? <laughs> Let's do it. Wow. I love it. That's awesome. Yeah. Big brain on Josh. <laughs> I'm going to make you a sticker, Josh. You can sell it. Yeah, there we go. Did I interrupt you, Tiffany? No, I was agreeing with both of you, um, but I will kind of maybe put a bow on the discussion and just say, just like anything um, within customer success, it's all about managing expectations. Um, I have been in a position where I've put um, a CSM growing her career in a position to be a manager over her peers. Um, and it was just really important that we like set the expectations out of the gate. This dynamic is going to change. Um, here's what that means. Um, and you have X, Y, Z outlets if this makes you uncomfortable. Yeah, I love that. I wish I had had more managers do that for me as I was moving up my career, because that would have solved so many problems as, <laughs> as part of my career development too. So that's cool, Tiffany. Yeah, I was fortunate. I was fortunate to have somebody very early in my career uh, as a mentor who's still a friend of mine. I still keep in touch with her uh, that uh, basically kind of set that precedent with me. And uh, as I grew into my leadership roles, I use that same approach. So, you know, mm -hmm. but even if you don't have that mentor, just learn from us here, right? Yeah. This is, this is what we are here for. And set the um, example, make change. Yeah, exactly. And, and, uh, and by the way, we've, we've come to the end of our time together today. Uh, and I wanted to say how awesome our conversation has been as, as I expected, I said that during our prep call on Monday, right. With, the, with the three of you. Uh, but Hey, it, it, it's, it's, uh, you know, what, what matters most to us is what all of you think. So I, I kindly ask you to share your, your feedback on LinkedIn, tagging me, our guests or success coaching a big thank you to our amazing panelists for genuine, genu generously sharing their ideas, their thoughts, their insights and best practices. Uh, and let me leave you with this thought. Exceptional customer success managers understand that they don't have all the answers, but they sure know where to find them. That's why we created the CSM Mastermind to tap into the collective knowledge and experience of our community to support everyone's growth. Uh, and remember to sign up and mark your calendars for our next event on November 15th, when we'll dive deep into the sometimes tense relationship between customer success and sales. Until then, I said this earlier, until then, remember to carve out time for yourself and prioritize your mindset each day. Wishing you all a fantastic rest of the day, an amazing week, and a phenomenal month ahead, and we'll see you soon.